New U.S. sanctions on Iran took effect today. Six months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the international nuclear deal. The sanctions targeted Iran's shipping, financial, and energy sectors all key to the country's already struggling economy. The bombs, which the FBI referred to as improvised explosive devices, were sent to the FBI's bomb laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. We're in Mexico again tonight as thousands of migrants try to find a faster way to the U.S. border. The White House says it's now getting help from the Mexican government. Breaking news out of Pittsburgh. The man accused in the shooting at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh is pleading not guilty, and he also wants a jury trial. You can see he's facing a 44 counts. So in the final seconds before the Boeing 737 Max crashed into the water, it was traveling at more than 500 kilometers an hour. All 189 people on board were killed. You've now entered the House of Mystery. Crime, conspiracy, history, and science. With your hosts, Al Warren, Mike Brown, Julie Saab, Michael Butterfield, Dr. Joseph Usinski, and Michael Hawley. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Tonight we have Jay Margolis and Richard Boskin. Um, how are you guys doing today? We're doing, doing great, thanks. Now let's start out by telling the listeners um, a little bit about yourselves. An author and freelance journalist now for over 30 years. I've written over 30 books. Um, I had a New York Times bestseller with a biography of Princess Diana. I've done my main focus on books has been uh, film, music you know, popular culture, um, but I have branched out in various ways. I've written for magazines around the world, and uh, I, I basically was born in London, England, and I moved to Los Angeles in 1995, and then relocated to Chicago in 1999, and that's where I've been ever since. And Jay? Yes, uh, I'm an investigative reporter, and I like to deal with you know, deaths that seem unresolved, uh, Marilyn Monroe being one of them. Another one that I am working on is Robert Kennedy. In fact, for, you know, my second book, The Murder of Marilyn Monroe, Case Closed, there's a postscript, 19-page postscript, in which, you know, we reveal for the first time who murdered Robert Kennedy. We reveal the identity of the third shooter. Um, so... I have a background. I'm a just on a research scholar for writing a paper on African American reparations. I went to the University of Southern California. I graduated a year early. And I'm just very interested in resolving things that seem unresolved as far as famous unsolved deaths. Well, thank you for taking the time and, and uh, coming on the show. Uh, really appreciate it. Pleasure. Now, uh, first of all, let's let's talk about uh, how you guys got onto the uh, Marilyn Monroe and the Case Closed book. Uh, what what led you to write about this? Well, back in the sort of early to mid nineties, around nineteen ninety three, actually, I started um, a book about the films of Marilyn, and the whole idea there was, you know, there've been so many books about her life, her affairs, her death. You know, how about doing a book about you know her career no one had really done one that was in depth so I did that book it took me a few years to write and research it actually ended up coming out in 2001 it was called Blonde Heat the sizzling screen career of Marilyn Monroe however during the course of doing that book people would constantly be asking me what my theory was about her death and you know it was amazing uh, however much I was focusing on the film career the way that Marilyn died, the circumstances, the mystery surrounding it, that was clearly what's still fascinating people. And so when, you know, I basically hooked up with Jay and he was, you know, focusing on that aspect of, of her life, it was like, okay, let's go for it. He, he, he'd already done so much research and it was so stunning, actually, what he was coming up with. For me, it was really a compelling subject to write a book about. Right. And, and Jay, what brought you to uh, Marilyn Monroe? Well, um, you know, the first book I ever picked up on Marilyn Monroe was by George Barris, and 
you know, I was always fascinated because every book that I picked up, you know, whether it be, you know, George Barris's book, because he personally believed that she was murdered. And so he wrote that in his own 1995 book. And so everybody had these three different camps. There was the murder, suicide, or accident. Those, these were the three main arguments that people kept, you know, believing in. And so I said, well, that seems pretty unresolved. And so I said, well, I'd like to investigate that. And it just, you know, led me to believe that she was murdered with an empty stomach. I mean, that that there is a big red flag. Right. And so uh, when you um, took this up, um, did you did you sort of have a fascination with Marilyn, or were you a fan, or or not? Um, I was definitely a fan. I, I you know thought that she was a beautiful woman, and I said, wow, you know, this is pretty unique that she at the time of her death, was the most famous woman in the world. I mean, nobody else had ever done that at that time. And now we have something different. You know, in today's age, you have uh, Instagram where anybody can, you know, get a million followers, you know, if they really know what they're doing. So it's not like the same. It, you know, it's it's just a different time period, and things have changed. But during her time period, there was no Internet. And so for her to be able to do that was nothing short of remarkable to become the most famous woman in the world. That that was definitely fascinating. It was a big, you know, thing that drew me to her. Right. Yeah, and in my case, it was that she, she was a really a self-made woman, um, you know, swimming against the tide of the Hollywood studio system, which was run by guys. And, uh, you know, over the course of her career, she not only it really came up with that whole breathy, dumb blonde Marilyn Monroe persona that everyone knows and loves, but she then, you know, also went on to become a serious actress. She had intense coaching under several top drama coaches and uh, ended up forming her own production company, having choice of director and script and co-stars. And, uh, you know, this is someone who really came from nothing and made herself the icon that she became. Right. And so she was probably the biggest star at the time of her death, I would imagine. I think Liz Taylor was doing quite well, too, but um, I, I would say she was probably the big box office at the time. Yeah, she was. Um, Liz Taylor, as you said, was commanding actually a million dollars for being in Cleopatra, which was more than Marilyn was getting. But um, one of the you know things that had been incorrectly reported down the years is that Marilyn was, you know, died kind of in disgrace that her career was in the doldrums. She was fired from her last film. Uh, what wasn't known at the time, and has only come out over the years, is that in fact, you know, when her last film, when she was fired from it, they tried to replace Marilyn in that film, Something's Got to Give. Her co-star, Dean Martin, refused to work with anyone other than Marilyn. And so they ended up having to go back to her and upping her salary from $100,000 to half a million dollars and with a contract for a second film at the same fee. So actually her career was on the rise, not on, on you know, the downward spiral when she died. Where, where do you think she was going at the time? So she was, um, um, cause, yeah, like you said, a lot's reported about her, you know, being fired and not, not doing well in the movie and... Uh, and uh, she wasn't getting along with her husband at the time either. So, oh, um, at the time that something's got to give, she was not married. Oh, she wasn't still with the, that uh, producer? Arthur Miller, no. No, she had already divorced him. She had already divorced him. So, so that's kind of why I think people were sort of leaning towards suicide. Now, why did the studio keep that quiet that they had rehired her? It was very convenient for the studio. Um, basically... They rehired her just before her death. They hadn't announced that yet, because really that would put egg on their face, but they would have to announce it, of course. She died in the meantime, so they didn't have to. So they just left it like that, and the general public never knew what the backstory was. So do you think the studio had anything to do with her, her death? No, not directly. They had a lot to do with the cover-up after her death, you know, once they were notified, they uh, took the documents that promised to, you know, rehire her. I mean, they did a whole cleanup job of where anything that was in their benefit, they were cleaning up. Well, why do you think that is? Like, if they well, did it, it, 
because otherwise they would have to, you know, it, it, you know, show how, you know, they had given her a new contract, and that doesn't make them look too good. They had the motive, means, and opportunity to do what they did, and they they took advantage of that. So, so now you were saying, mentioning earlier, Richard, that she sort of put on that persona. So yeah. she she was quite different than what people perceived her. Yes, she was. A, she was way more intelligent than not only how the general public may have perceived her, but certainly how the studio bosses did. Because, you know, as I said, she rose through the ranks uh, from a starlet to a superstar based on that breathy, dumb blonde persona. And that was, you know, cash at the box office for 20th Century Fox. They didn't want to meddle with that formula. So when she then basically had established herself and said, now I want to be taken seriously, I want to be in maybe a casting of the film The Brothers Karamazov, they virtually laughed at her. It was like, you, are you kidding? You know, A, you know, like you're not capable of that, and B, we're not interested. And so that's the point at which she actually walked out on her contract. It was after she'd completed the seven-year itch, and she walked out and went, to New York for a year, studied at the Actors Studio in New York under Lee Strasberg, and uh, refused to return until it was on her terms. And that's exactly what happened. That persona, um, I remember actually the daughter of, uh, I think, yeah, actually, yeah, it was, it was the daughter of Lee Strasberg, Susan Strasberg, the actress. She was walking with Marilyn in New York one day down down the New York street, and said, uh, you know, Marilyn was just in a headscarf and dark glasses. No one knew it was Marilyn Monroe. She was incognito. And she turned to uh, Susan and said, do you want to see Marilyn? I was like, yeah. And she basically just changed the way she walked, moved the hips a bit. And suddenly everyone was, you know, the heads were turning. It was Marilyn Monroe. She could turn and turn off that, you know, turn on and turn off that persona at will. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that. And, uh, so and now Jay, you were talking about. So she divorced Jay, Arthur Miller. Um, now the story is she was going to remarry uh, DiMaggio. Uh, that is correct. She was uh, into statements that um, were made by her half sister Bernice Miracle and her niece Mona Ray Miracle. They both made statements that are very affirmative that she was going to remarry Joe DiMaggio. In fact, um, Mona Ray says that according to Bernice, that Marilyn was looking forward to that, that she was looking forward to remarrying him, that it was definitely going to happen. In fact, the executor of Joe DiMaggio's estate, Morris Engelberg, who was in no relation to Marilyn's physician, Dr. Engelberg, uh, Morris uh, said that uh, the date was set for August 8, 1962, which was actually the date that they had her funeral instead, which is unfortunate. Hmm. And so did we ever hear anything from DiMaggio himself about that? Or? Um, no, he was always you know, notoriously um, tight-lipped about anything that would reveal the relationship between him and Monroe. He did this out of respect to her. He didn't want you know, anything about his relationship with her to be exploited, and that's why he never said a word about anything. And so let's let's start back with the uh, the drug use. Now, uh, a lot of people and press have put out that she was uh, using a lot of drugs, a lot of uh, alcohol and sleeping pills and that. Um, what what did you find out about her drug use? Well, I mean, you know, it, she was not like uh, any worse than any other person who was given pills at the studio. Um, she did get addicted to sleeping pills towards the end, and her psychiatrist, Dr. Greenson, claimed he was concerned. And he, you know, allegedly was trying to wean her off of sleeping pills with her physician, Dr. Engelberg. And he claimed that instead of her taking Nebutal, which is the one that she often takes, uh, that she would often take, um, you know, he was trying to wean her off of that and then to take chloral hydrate. And Dr. Engelberg claimed he never prescribed it, but if you look at the prescription that he wrote on June 7th, 1962, one day before she's fired from something's got to give, it's very clear that Engelberg prescribed chloral hydrate, so he clearly lied when he said that Marilyn must have gotten it, gotten it from Tijuana. And so um, they were allegedly weaning her off of these pills 
and and but Marilyn herself said that chlorohydrate was very mild, and it was something that she really didn't particularly care for. She liked Nebutol, but as far as dependency, if she, she was not an alcoholic, uh, she may have had her Dom Perignon uh, champagne, which she loved a lot, um, but she was not drinking every day. Right, and so both the Nebutol and the chlorohydrate, they're both sleeping pills or sleeping aids? Yes. They are sleeping aids, yes. Right. Yeah. And, and so why, why was her doctor kind of covering himself? Was he worried that he would be in trouble then? Or? Well, it, I think the reason that Engelberg lied was because he realized, he says, wow, this is an awful lot of you know prescriptions to be prescribing at the same time, and people might not understand if it in fact was true that they were trying to wean, wean her off of these pills, that there were just like 15 different types of pills pill bottles at her bedstand at the time that she died they were like wow that's an awful lot of pills and he probably didn't want to say yeah i prescribed an awful lot of those so he he was definitely covering for himself i believe yeah sort of the same thing going on today with stars isn't it with different drugs but uh, you know uh, with michael jackson and whitney houston and all that uh, Absolutely, yeah. There's always someone that these stars will find who will over-prescribe for them. And, you know, that's all well and good for, you know, for what they want to do. But, of course, if something goes wrong, then that's when you know what hits the fan. Yeah, yeah, it's too bad. But, but you know, I guess it's also tough to say no when they're a big star. Well, that's the point. Yeah, I, I remember, you know, um, reading about Elvis Presley and uh, they were... There were several occasions where the, you know, the people around him tried to dry him out and put him in the hospital and have him go cold turkey and off the prescription meds and, and the junk food. And there was one occasion where he found some kid going past his room and said, hey, can you go out and get me some burgers? And the kid did. <laughs> You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, 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 yeah, you probably wouldn't say no. I mean, Elvis Presley yeah. at the time, right? You know. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. So, uh, and what can you tell us about now? So, that's a lot of talk, you know, drug use, and and also about the Kennedys and her relationships with both John F. and Bobby. Um, uh, what can you tell us about JFK and uh, Marilyn? Well, well, I can um, tell you that from the so I can tell you that the JFK Marilyn affair very likely started up in the 1950s, before long before he was president. Actually, um, you know he suffered with severe back problems, and there was one occasion in the mid 50s where he was in the hospital, and one of the people who visited him reported that there was a portrait of Marilyn on his bedside table in the hospital room. At that, so it's very likely it started that early. Right, yeah. And so you don't think they were having an affair at the time of her death? Oh, uh, well, see, the thing is, is that at the time of her death, she had switched over to Bobby Kennedy, in which uh, Fred Otash, the private eye who bugged her house and Peter Lawford's house, he noticed from all the tapes that he was listening to that there apparently now were more uh, bugging tapes of Bobby and Marilyn as opposed to um, Jack and Marilyn. And so she had switched over from, you know, sleeping with John F. Kennedy, um, which is a well-documented um, case in March 24th to March 26th, 1962, at Bing Crosby's house in Palm Springs. It's very well accepted by um, almost every Maryland biographer that there was a tryst there because Ralph Roberts, her trusted masseur, uh, came back and told Maryland biographers, and nobody ever, you know, doubted him at all, that she did sleep with the president on that date, um, March 24th to March 26, 1962. And so um, another trusted friend, uh, Sidney Gulliroff, who was her hairstylist since the Asphalt Jungle in 1950, um, he also relayed in his own book that on the last day of her life, Marilyn called him about 2.30 p.m. and said that Bobby Kennedy and Peter Lawford had just left her house and she told him in confidence that, yes, I'm sleeping with um, JFK, and then I'm um, also sleeping with Robert Kennedy, and everything had gone wrong. And so she was worried, and she said that she didn't tell a lot of people that she was having affairs with the Kennedy brothers, um, but she also told Gulliroff that uh, she threatened Bobby and said that I'm going to go public, 
And then Bobby's response, according to Marilyn, uh, was, if you threaten me, Marilyn, there's more than one way to keep you quiet. And so at that point, you know, Bobby left and Marilyn was hysterical and crying when she was on the phone with Gulerov relaying all this information. Wow. And and so you also sort of um, um, partake. Now, so you think she was pregnant at the time of her death? No, that no. is not that is not true. So, so she was still having an affair. You think with both Kennedys at the, at, by the time August was happening, or you know, uh, John Danoff, who was uh, working for Bernie Spindell, he made a comment that um, on the tapes that he was hearing, and, and don't mistake this for you know them all having sex at the same time. That's not what it was. Um, you know, Marilyn was actually alternating between John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy. So oftentimes it was believed that once she was done with Jack, she'd move on to Bobby. But according to John Danoff and what he heard, sometimes there were instances where she'd go with John and then go back to Bobby and then back to John again. Right. And so now, now you're so you're really kind of eliminating the suicide thought. Like uh, you're not, um, you're prescribing. There's absolutely no way that she committed suicide. There's a number of compelling reasons for this. Uh, you know, right now. She couldn't have had the enough enough drugs to match the amount of drugs that were in her blood. So she couldn't she didn't have that many pills to match those amount of drugs in her body. See, she would have needed um, 47 Nebitals, but she had a prescription for 25 Nebitals on July 25th, 1962, and then she got a refill for 25 pills on August 3rd, 1962. So that's a total of 50. And Ralph Roberts from Masur said she took about six Nebitals a day. And so that would assume that she'd wait and not take those six every day in order to take the 47 that killed her. But that's, that's really just not logical. And yeah, also, I, I, I'm the not, fact I, that she had no pills yeah. in her stomach, you know, she had absolutely nothing in her stomach, and, and she was a, purported to have 64 pills. So where did 64 pills go from her stomach? Yeah, and an another thing is that, you know, there are photos, actually, of the death scene um, shot by the police, and you see empty pill bottles on the bedside table with the caps all neatly screwed back on. I mean, someone in that state, if they're kind of, you know, shoving pills down their throat at that rate, would they then take the time to meticulously put the, the caps back on these empty bottles and just line them up on the table? It, it's a stage, it was a stage scene. Uh, now, what did the coroner give for an opinion then? The coroner did a really strange thing. Coroner Curphy, he gave this press conference. Uh, see, she was uh, murdered on August 4th, 1962. The body was discovered dead on, um, on the 5th. And then on the 18th, he gave this public press conference in which he said, quote, it is, and it is our opinion that it is a probable suicide. He said that in, it is our opinion. So he's not even saying that this is definitive. He's just, you know, causing more and more speculation, um, which is really suspicious because he did assert that she would have had to have swallowed 47 nebitals and a large amount of chloral hydrate. And, and yet Dr. Noguchi has always, you know, stated it was suicide. But over the years, when you see him on camera, like on History's Mysteries, he'll say stuff like, you know, the, the coroner's office tried to prove suicide, but they, they couldn't, you know, actually show any factors that would lead to suicide. So he's kind of playing around it, you know, but without diverting from his initial findings. But you could tell that there's more that he knows than he's saying. Right. And, and so now you were mentioning that she was being uh, bugged. Like, uh, there was people basically listening to her. Yes, I spoke with uh, the sound man who went with uh, Fred Otash the night that she died, and he, you know, was responsible for listening to those tapes, and he said that, yes, there was, there, uh, Bobby and Marilyn were sleeping together, and yes, uh, John F. Kennedy and Marilyn Monroe were sleeping together from what he heard on the tapes. And, I mean, he was the one that was listening to them. He's the one that took him out on the orders of the Kennedys. Uh, Fred Otash had many different clients. Um, you know, he was working, you know, for Jimmy Hoffa at one point in which the bugs were installed. He noticed that other bugs were also installed when he was putting them in there. So there were many different people listening in. There was the FBI, the CIA, the Jimmy Hoffa. Um, at one point, even Howard Hughes, according to Fred Otash. 
And so many different clients were there listening at, um, in on what Marilyn was doing. I mean, J. Edgar Hoover was no fan of the Kennedys. So, you know, any evidence he could get on their indiscretions, you know, was gold dust to him. So, as Jay says, there were many vested interests in this. So what can you tell us about her last day then? Well, um, she threatened to hold a press conference. And, you know, when Bobby Kennedy came to her house and said, hey, you can't see me, you can't see Jack, you know, we don't want you to write anymore. We don't want you to call anymore. And so I've always found it suspicious that once I've discovered that Bobby Kennedy was at her house, that all of a sudden she just has a lethal amount of drugs in her body a few hours later. I mean, is that just like a really strange coincidence? I don't think so. The two events are connected. You know, it's it just, this is, I mean, this, if, this is totally scary. You know how a man like Bobby Kennedy can try to attempt to hide his presence at her house and then say, oh, I was at John Bates, you know, ranch in Gilroy, um, you know, near uh, San Francisco. You know, I mean, how could he, you know, do that unless he had these absolutely powerful resources to cover up every one of his tracks? And that's exactly what he did. And but there are just there's like more than 20 witnesses that saw him there. So that he can't deny that. And so uh, so you're kind of putting him behind the murder then? Yes, he was he was the one that that made it happen. Okay. And so who do you think was uh, who else was involved? You you're putting like the psychiatrist Ralph Greenson, uh yeah, Ralph Greenson the psychiatrist stuck a heart needle into her chest. He tried to play it off for any witnesses including the ambulance attendants who were witnessing that this that it was like adrenaline, but it wasn't because James Hall the ambulance attendant said, "Well, I've always stated it was a brownish fluid." So it was an undiluted pentobarbital injection to the heart. But according to James Hall, the attendant, he said that Greenson told him, I've got to make a show of this. So Greenson's trying to make it sound like he's trying to help her, but he's really trying to kill her. And so he sticks it into her heart. And there were five eyewitnesses. There's the two attendants, James Hall, Murray Leibowitz. Murray Leibowitz told Donald Wolf in 1993 that, yes, James Hall's telling the truth. And then Peter Lawford confirms the two attendants by stating Quote, Marilyn has got to be silenced, Bobby told Greenson, or something to that effect. Greenson had thus been set up by Bobby to take care of Marilyn, end quote. And so the reason that Greenson has the motive to do this is, A, he's sick and tired of his patient. He constantly complains that he has to deal with her six, seven times a week when she's calling up. And the thing that put him over the top was that Greenson was tricked by Bobby Kennedy, uh, Bobby said to him, look, not only is she going to go public on Monday morning, August 6th, with this press conference exposing me and Jack, she's going to go and expose you, too, with your affair with her. And so Bobby used Greenson to get rid of Marilyn. See, Bobby convinced the psychiatrist that um, Marilyn would also go public with the psychiatrist, but in, in reality, Marilyn was only going to go public with Bobby and Jack. But Bobby convinced him that uh, he would go public with Greenson's affair, too. Well, um, Marilyn was sleeping with Greenson. Um, she was not going to go public with that affair. She, uh, Bobby just convinced him that that was true. Uh, and that was, you know, for Greenson as a psychiatrist, not only was he married, but, you know, that went against professional ethics, so that would get him disbarred. Right. And, and so um, after the murder, what was... Uh, what was uh, what was Greenson's uh, kind of view on it? Did he ever talk about it, or did anybody ever follow up with him? Yes, uh, Greenson did a very strange thing. You know, um, he, uh, uh, Roy Turner, who was Marilyn's genealogist, he once wrote to Greenson in eighth grade because he was doing like this, you know, a uh, book report, and he chose Marilyn. And so he had to write to Greenson and say, well, what is this whole business about how she died? And so Greenson wrote him back and said, well, I just want to make it very clear that she did not commit suicide, you know, and so that goes against, you know, the the official verdict. And so it's very strange how he keeps hinting that, you know, she didn't commit suicide because he did love his patient, you know, he, but he did feel, you know, very bitter after he realized that Bobby Kennedy had tricked him because he perhaps may not have gone through with it, even though he was sick of his patient. I think that just tricking him into thinking that his affair would be exposed, that's the thing that really got him to do it. 
Otherwise, I'm I'm pretty convinced he may not have gone through with that. So now, on her in her last day, did, did anybody talk to her before she died, or did she did she get any, anybody have any witness of how what her mood was like? If she was depressed, if she was happy? Oh yes, you know, uh, Gloria Romanoff told me that um, on August fifth, the evening of August fifth, you know, August fifth was the day that she was discovered dead. But the evening, she said that Marilyn had a dinner engagement with Frank Sinatra. And also, uh, Gloria Romanoff would be there. And she told me that she was so happy about wanting to, you know, go and see him. And she was thinking about, well, what should I wear? What kind of dress should I wear? She was just really, you know, focused on, on attending that dinner engagement. So why would she kill herself? And, and Ralph Roberts said that that last weekend, she was the happiest that, she, that he had ever seen her in quite some time. And so he actually made a statement himself and said, I think somebody done her in. He said that, and and he doesn't believe that she committed suicide. He called Greenson at 6 p.m. on the last day of uh, Marilyn's life, trying to confirm a dinner engagement that, sh- that he and Marilyn had on August 4th, the evening of August 4th, and he a- answered the phone. Greenson said, uh, she's not here right now, and he hung up, and he was all rude about it. And so... You know, Ralph Roberts thought that that was very suspicious. He did not trust, you know, the official verdict. And at that point, he is one of the many trusted friends, including George Barris, who believe that she was murdered. Yeah, I mean, a number of people I spoke with, you know, have to bear in mind that, of course, people can express, you know, they're feeling great or whatever, you know, to friends, loved ones, and then still kill themselves. You know, um, they may be hiding something or... Their mind may just flip on them. But th- there were an uh, overwhelming number of people who even told me um, during the course of, you know, researching th- the original book, the My Blonde Heat book, um, that she seemed very upbeat in that last week of her life. You know, the story has always been that, oh, she was so depressed about the end of the relationship with the Kennedys. But in fact, um, her stand-in, Evelyn Moriarty, who was Marilyn's stand-in on her final three movies, said that she spoke with Marilyn a couple of nights before she died. And she was really upbeat because... You know, she'd won the battle with 20th Century Fox and uh, she couldn't wait to get back to work. And she was phoning the members of the cast and crew, you know, really excited and looking forward to, you know, what was coming up for her. So, again, that is not, you know, definitive evidence that she didn't commit suicide, but it's another contributing piece of evidence. Right. So has she had, now? Did she attempt suicide before in her life, or was this like a? a yeah, I mean, she did. Uh, the, there were about maybe half a dozen times when she attempted suicide before. And Natasha Lightes can attest to a time when she had just been dropped from Columbia Pictures, and you know she just knew that Marilyn wanted to be the best actress that she could be, and when she was dropped that was just very discouraging to her so she felt you know there was an attempt to take her life there but arthur miller can also attest to a time and it wasn't like you know she it was just a part of her life where she felt discouraged you know she had more strength later on she was able to be more confident in being an actress and she knew that that was what she was going to do is be the best actress that she could be she wanted to get away from all these dumb blonde roles. You know, she wanted to um, just do serious roles that, that were not going to just pigeonhole her and make it so that she'd be doing the same movie over and over again. Yeah. Now that, that's a tough thing in itself. Anytime someone even stars today, if they get kind of uh, in a certain frame, people think of them as a certain thing. It's a tough thing to change. It is. You know, she was. I mean, as I said before, that was, you know, something that she was battling right through her career was to divest herself of the dumb blonde image and someone who was kind of helpless. And the fact that she had attempted suicide and did have a sleeping pill problem and did enjoy the Dom Perignon, that, of course, really helped with, you know, the stories that she basically killed herself, that she was irresponsible you know, was a, a wreck of a human being and wanted to die. So do you think this was really, uh, like, premeditated? Like, did they sort of plan the the date and the time and what they were going to do, or was it just sort of, did the events just occur? 
I think that, you know, it just, everything led to another part of it happening. It was not something that was, like, completely planned. There was one thing that was for sure. Bobby Kennedy could not find that red diary of Marilyn's, you know, the, the night that she died. So they had to go to Plan B, you know. And, and so Bobby, you know, contacted the psychiatrist. According to Peter Lawford, Bobby called up Greenson and told him, said, hey, look, you know, she's going public with your affair, too. you got to do this thing. And so he gave him a needle, and then, you know, Greenson stuck it into Marilyn's heart, and that was the end of that. And then, um, you know, about four hours later after all this, Greenson's the one that calls the police and says, hey, she committed suicide. He tells us Sergeant Jack Clemens. And so it's very curious how he's telling the first officer at the scene that she committed suicide, and then he's telling other people down the line that, that she did not commit suicide. You see, because it makes him look bad that, that a patient allegedly committed suicide. It makes him look like he's, he's a, an unsuccessful psychiatrist. So it makes his whole image, it tarnishes his image. So he's like, has this balancing act. You know, he's got to balance Bobby Kennedy. And then he's got to balance, you know, his whole reputation of, of the fact that um, his patient purported to commit suicide. So he, there's a lot of things going on in his mind. Right. And so what did the ambulance drivers think? Like, or, you know, the people that showed up, um, didn't they notice her, like, and him jabbing her in the heart? And Yes. You see, here's the thing, is that James Hall said that there was nothing sinister at the time that he witnessed this. He, he thought it was adrenaline and, and that he tried to save her and it failed and that, you know, she was overdosing. But he said that there was something very strange. When he started to smell her mouth, there was no odor of, of pear, so there's no way she could have swallowed those chloral hydrate pills. And so he also knows there's no indication of vomit. You know, most people who take a lot of drugs, they vomit the pills up. He said there was no indication of vomit. He said that she was still alive and that she was still breathing, but just barely. And so he tried to get her off of the bed. They put her on the floor so that they can give her CPR. Her color started to come back. And then all of a sudden, Greenson pushes him aside and says, give her positive pressure. And so then Greenson pulls out of his, his little bag, his medical bag, and pulls out a heart needle with a heart, um, I mean a syringe with a heart needle already affixed to it. And then he says, I gotta insert this between the blank and blank ribs. And then he just inserts it right into her heart. And, and then he says, I'm gonna pronounce her dead after a few minutes. And so James Hall thought this was so strange. He thought that if, had he not come in there, they could have safely taken her away to the hospital. Right. But it wasn't until 20 years later when they did a serious investigation of this case when he learned for the first time that the autopsy report said there were no pills in her stomach. He said, well, now I kind of question what I saw. And he always mentioned it was a brownish fluid. And so that's not adrenaline. Right. And so there was nothing in her stomach. Wouldn't that sort of, sort of bring up questions? Yes, absolutely, because, you know, there are enough drugs in her blood to kill three people. You see, there were 4.5 milligrams per cent of nebutol in her blood, which is equivalent to 47 nebutols. And then there's 8 milligrams per cent of chloral hydrate in her blood, which is equivalent to 17 chloral hydrates. That's about 64 pills. And yet, you know, Noguchi says, I didn't find any refractal crystals from any of the nebutol, no refractal crystals from any of the chloral hydrate. And all the medical professionals that are competent that you interview, they will tell you that there should have been undissolved capsules. So what that means is that she didn't swallow the drugs that killed her. And do you think this could have happened today? Now, if, it, if this was like... No. There's just... no way this could have happened today. You know, something on, on YouTube would have been on there in a few minutes. I mean, somebody would have, you know, captured something with their iPhone. The neighbors, you know, actually... Mary W. Goody Coons Barnes, who was uh, her neighbor at 12304, where Mrs. Murray, the housekeeper, and her son-in-law, Norman Jeffries, where they stayed while they waited for Bobby Kennedy and these two police officers, Archie Case and James Ahern, to leave. They, uh, she, was, she saw Bobby Kennedy go in there, uh, Mary W. Goody Coons Barnes. She saw Bobby Kennedy go in there with Archie Case and James Ahern. And so had she had an iPhone, she would have been capturing them on camera. You know, but of course, this was back in 1962, and so we didn't have any of that. And they, and the principals at the scene were able to control the scene, you know, pretty much by just having all their people cover it up. 
Yeah, and that's very true. I, I a lot of our listeners, we do a lot of stuff from uh, JFK's assassination and stuff, and people don't realize how different it was. Now, were you able to talk to the neighbors, or was it? Did they ever make a statement? Statement. Well, see, uh, Mary W. Goody Coon's barn. She died in 1964, and you know she uh, talked to Sergeant Jack Clemens in 1962, days after Marilyn, you know, uh, Marilyn's death. And, the, and she didn't give her name to Sergeant Jack Clemens, but the reason that we found out for the very first time in all the books written on Marilyn Monroe was, and it's not even on the deeds of the house on 12304 Fifth Helena Drive. See, Joan Greenson wrote in her manuscript, which, seal, which is sealed from the public until 2039, that, quote, Marilyn found out that the neighbor you could see from her property was a professor at the university. This was UCLA professor Ralph Mosser Barnes, and his wife was Mary W. Goody Coons Barnes. And so we now know who that neighbor was that spoke to Sergeant Jack Clemens, but she passed away in 1964, and Clemens relayed that, that she saw Bobby Kennedy and, and those two men go into her house at nighttime at, on the last you know night of her life. And so we also have statements by the neighbors Abe Landau and Ruby Landau who assert that there was an ambulance, you know, around midnight, and that's when they got home, you know, from their dinner party, and the Landau's reported that there was an ambulance there. This is the same observation that Fred Otash made to Lynn Franklin, um, to Detective Lynn Franklin. He also notated that an ambulance was present at the scene. Wow. Amazing story. So how do people get a hold of you guys? Do you have a web page or anything people should know about? Well, in my case, um, it's richardbuskin.com, R-A-C-H-A-R-D-B-U-S-K-I-N.com. And, uh, you know, that, that will basically give the lowdown on my career, the books I've written. I've written over 30 books. Um, so you can see samples of my work on there. And, you know, the book obviously is um, up on Amazon. Right. Okay, you can get a hold of me at Marilyn Monroe 1962 at Outlook.com if you have any questions. Well, guys, thank you very much. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. <laughs> The end. By George, he's got it. It is the end. I'll say it. If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.